1900s. A youngster in the area remembers kōkāko being so numerous that you could throw clumps of soil at them. A comprehensive survey in 1993 found 25 kōkāko left in the whole of the Hinoa Ranges. Now they had five pairs and they watched them for a season only to find that four of those pairs were male-male pairs because there were not enough females to go around. By not enough females to go around, there was one female left. In 2017, they decided to reintroduce kiwi into the Hinoa Ranges. That didn't work out because of ferrets. If we as properties surrounding the Hinoa Ranges do our bit to minimise as much as we can on our properties, then there's less pressure of pests reinvading the ranges and less pressure on the various populations in the Hinoa Ranges. A lot of people out there, they come onto a country block or they've been farming that country block for a really long time. And when you start talking pest control, it's a very overwhelming task. It's a lot of ground to cover. Where do you start? Um, and we're here to uh, help to start that conversation and make it simple to know where to start. Lenny. I am the pest control coordinator for Friends of Te Wairoa. I've been doing this role for about three years now. Our main goal is to get landowners into pest control. I'm Willow, local resident. Probably was started to be interested in uh, bird life and all the natural environment back in the Netherlands. When I came to New Zealand, it didn't stop there, of course. I'm Lenny. I've been the pest control coordinator in the area for like the last three years. I'm helping landowners get into pest control because obviously it's quite overwhelming, particularly when you've got like 300 acres and you don't know where to start. But my background is I did a Bachelor of Science at Auckland University majoring in biology and environmental science. So ecology and the greater ecosystem side of thing is my main passion. Pest control is just a piece of that. I've also, alongside what I do, have been writing about the history of the Kokako management area in the Hinoa Ranges, which is kind of a nice segue into why we do pest control on private property as well. So we'll talk about the different ways you can tackle pests on private property towards the end and then plenty of time for asking questions as well. So if we go back to the start of last century, the 1900s, Joe St Paul was a youngster in the area and he remembers kōkāko being so numerous that you could throw clumps of soil at them. Fast forward to the mid-1900s and the first ever kōkāko nest found in the Hinoa Ranges was photographed. That was the first time kōkāko had ever been observed on the nest and documented. Probably were observed on the nest by Māori before obviously, but this was the first time it had been documented and studied. By sort of the 70s, they started to realise that the Kōkāko population was really declining very quickly. Part of the reason for the decline was the deforestation, and then the next big one was the pests. Kōkāko aren't very good flyers. They've got really long legs, so they hop around, but really short wings. So they can glide a little bit, and they can fly a little, but they mostly hop around. So as soon as you reduce that forest cover and create an edge to the forest, they can no longer get from one forest segment to another with ease. Um, so yeah, they've just, their habitat has shrunk so much, and the predation pressure while they've been sitting on the nest, which is why there was only one female, because they're so vulnerable at that point. Um, yeah, they just, just sit there waiting, because they're... Yeah. Quietly, because if there's danger from the top, if sit quiet, you know, he sees me, and I'm safe. But in the meantime, the rat comes up or the, the mm. stoat comes up and just grabs, because and the, the animal's still sitting there. That's quite common among a lot of New Zealand uh, native animals. They are all used to predation from above, so none of them are used to predation from below, so they're not used to watching for mammals, because New Zealand never had any mammals except for our bats, which are flying anyway. So they did a comprehensive survey in 1993 and they found 25 kōkāko left in the whole of the Hinoa Ranges. Now they had five pairs and they watched them for a season and they protected the nests only to find that four of those pairs were male-male pairs because there were not enough females to go around. By not enough females to go around there was one female left. Yeah, scary times. So Auckland Council and DOC 
came together in the first time that Auckland Council had ever participated in a species recovery project. That's just not something that they used to do. They worked really hard and the most recent survey has produced over 500 birds. I remember that 16 or 17 years ago I found a little ad in the, in the paper asking for volunteers and the Hunua Rangers uh, to do pest control to protect the kokako. For three years I had that little ad in my, uh, and the phone number in my diary because I couldn't leave home because of the young kids. And then a project started up around the Hunua Falls and I was in. And from there on I was not only uh, trapping and baiting on my own property to protect our chooks because we are, our chooks got taken out by ferrets at some point, but also in the Hunua Ranges. From there on grew more and more. I got contracted by Auckland Council too to do pest control within the Hunua Ranges in the projects, the Kokako management area and pickets. I got asked at some point to help set up um, Friends of Te Wairua as a new entity to protect the, um, the Wairua River and uh, the environment uh, around it, the, the catchment area. Friends of Funua Ranges, I was part of that way back since the beginning. And it's all to do with uh, protecting our environment and um, part of that is um, to do pest control. His enthusiasm is infectious and that's where I get it from. <laughs> well, that's good. Yep, Indo indoctrinating uh, the young ones. <laughs> it's not indoctrinating really because um, we are protecting uh, our environment for the future, for our, uh, not for myself, uh, although I benefit from it, of course. Not for my daughter, because she, de she benefits from it, but for the children that haven't been born yet, because we have got a future as human beings, and that's what we're doing it for. We have lost a lot already, but we can still save a lot. The Rangers is now the second largest mainland population in New Zealand. So that's a lot of blood, sweat and tears, that one, because it's literally hiking into some of the toughest country in New Zealand, to be perfectly honest, like what's out there is similar to what's in the South Island and you get so disorientated with the mists and everything as well, particularly in the early days when they didn't have GPS. They didn't have, well they had topographic maps, but they went up the wrong ridges and things like that. And they had a string line to measure when the next bait station was gonna be. So it was, it, it was a lot of thinking about how you're gonna do it no pre-planning necessarily. It's find the nest, protect the nest, get the chicks to fledge and on to the next one. And in the beginning the um, protecting the nest was like uh, protecting it with a ring of steel which means you have located the, the uh, nest and in a 50 uh, metre uh, radius all the, way, all the way around you have the common red trap, just a snap trap, the kill trap. You've got um, bait stations, uh, you've got um, tunnels, um, you, you try all sort of stuff to uh, and not only for the rats but also for possums because possums uh, predate as well they do take the chicks and they do uh, take the eggs out of the nest and especially with the kokako um, a lot of New Zealand birds are actually um, primed to uh, still after all those years primed to um, be aware of danger from the air harsh eagle now we've introduced uh, over the last 150 200 years We've introduced um, rats, possums, stoats, ferrets, weasels, um, cats, um, and they are all ground um, predating animals. In saying that, the stoat and the rat, especially the ship rat, they can climb very well. They are athletes un amongst them. Mm -hmm. the, um, the stoat can swim for about two kilometers, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. So islands, if they're close enough to the mainland, they're still not safe. Yeah. if you would have eradicated all the um, stoats. The other cool thing about having this area that's protected by these volunteers that go in every Tuesday and every first, second Sunday of the month. Saturday. Yeah. Saturday. They go in, they hike for hours before they reach their bait line, then they do their bait line and then they hike out for hours. But they're not only protecting the kōkāko, there have been Hoxtetas frog surveys that, and the density of Hoxtetas frogs in the Hinoa Ranges is one of the highest of anywhere in New Zealand. You've got the long-tailed bats in there and we've recently done a survey through private property and the bats are filtering out into our habitats out here. So, and, and there are other bird species that are increasing and stuff in the ranges. So what we've got here is, um, you can drive to here but once you're here, you have to walk. There's two, 200 kilometers worth of bait lines 
that people hike. Every bait line should be 100 metres away from another bait line because the feeding um, um, area of a rat is about 50, 50 metres from one point, so it's 100 metres around. So if you have got bait lines 100 metres apart, you will catch those rats. On the bait lines themselves, you've got uh, the bait stations 50 metres apart. If you've got a free area, what I call a bait station free area, and it's just big enough, you have got rats that will, won't go to your bait stations because they are far enough away, which means that that's where it's a breeding hub for, for the next generation. So you'd think you've got a lot of rats killed, but there's actually a, a live hub just going there and it just keeps moving out towards uh, your birds. My biggest problem, I think, is it's easy enough to uh, catch a lot of predators and, and deal to them, but it's the last one and you have to keep going. Like Lenny says, um, to, to stay motivated to find the mm -hmm. last one and to deal to the last one so that you, you can never take a full break at this point because you might have your own patch or your bigger patch like the Huno Ranges cleaned out of uh, predators but then there's the surrounding uh, areas where there's reinvasion coming through. The ship rat, for example, um, you've got one female and one male. After a year you've got a thousand rats. So the second year, you don't need one female for every uh, one male for every female. Fifty males can do the job. So it's 950 females. That so it's it's you know you've got two rats, then you've got a thousand, and then suddenly it goes like wow. This is the this is what what we call the Hunua Ranges. This is with the fold, the Scossie Dam, um, Wairoa, Mangatafri, Mangatangi. Kaiawa area, Kaiawa and the coast area, Miranda. Um, the, the parking area is right up here. And our area, this is uh, Cashmore's block, Oriri, with the Oriri stream. So now we have got under control, um, under management, not under control. <laughs> <laughs> um, the area from here, my road track up here, Mangatafi. Mangatangi Ridge, uh, sorry, Mang Mangatafri track, this area here. Yeah, so it's actually That's quite this small. Area. Yeah. We have got a satellite because some uh, Kokaku ma managed to uh, escape our management area. <laughs> and they, they are around Ernie's track here. Yeah. And so we've got a, an area here as well. Yeah. So uh, what we're now doing is that, um, what we have been doing is because the Kokaku has come most likely through here. So we've put an extra few tracks in here. So the, both are now joined, so the satellite is joined with, uh, with the KMA, Kokaka Management Area. And that satellite is uh, Pickett's Campground. We've just concluded a survey for the Kokaka and 210 pairs were found within the project. 19 pairs were found in, at Pickett's, which is an enormous increase of, of uh, five years ago, four years ago. Mm. And then the 16 pairs have been found outside the area. Um, in 2018 there were a few pairs outside, but the numbers are increasing. Those, those uh, animals are not totally safe, um, maybe the, the older ones more than the younger ones, the, the chicks, because, and here we go, 1080 cleans out the area, the whole Huno Ranges. After six months the first rats are back in, after six months. So you get of those outside birds, because there's no further control after the 1080 drop, um, those might have one, maybe two clutches in one season that they can breed successfully. After that, they're again under threat because the rats have come back in. Um, after four or five months, the projects that we manage, they are being targeted again with poison. So the rats are being held under control there. If we take out the rats, then there, there should be enough feed for the population yeah. to sustain yeah. itself. So one of the cool things, um that I figured out while writing the book. So the project started in 1994, which was 28 years ago. And as of 2022, we are 28 years away from 2050, predator free 2050, hopefully. So if we can come this far in 28 years, maybe we can make it in another 28 years. If we can keep uh, a positive uh, look at it and keep uh, inspiring other people with good mm. stories, with the uh, success stories, yeah. and get them on board and keep them on board. That's, that's yeah, that's one, one of the of biggest things. One of the early ranges in the Kokaka Management Project um, in the Hinoas, when the morale used to get low, he used to say to people, well, 
we got to the moon. Did the rat get to the moon? No, so we can get him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yep. So one thing that we can do as landowners, and that's something where I, in my capacity for Friends Te Warua, is this Hinua Halo concept. Basically, if we as properties surrounding the Hinua Ranges do our bit to minimise as much as we can on our properties, then there's less pressure of pests reinvading the ranges and less pressure on the various populations in the Hinua Ranges. We did have one unfortunate incident in 2017 where they decided to reintroduce kiwi into the Hinua Ranges and that didn't work out because of ferrets. And we have since discovered we have a massive ferret problem in the local area. The mustelids have been introduced to, to control the rabbits, to get back to the rabbit problem as well. And, and of course, they, uh, as soon as they uh, make a dent in the rabbit population, they have to still feed. If the rabbit population is fairly high, then the success rate of breeding for rabbits, uh, for um, ferrets, of course, and stoats, is high as well because there's food around. So they dim diminish the, uh, the number of rabbits around, the food source, and then they have to go to something else. That's also when the numbers of ferrets and stoats will drop off because there's not enough food. They do attack the birds, yes, but it's not enough food. Which means that the rabbits come back up again. So it's a seesaw. One property down the road has almost caught 100 ferrets since the first lockdown. So there's That's one property. Their populations are increasing yeah. because there's not enough people trapping them. To, to reduce the numbers. There's a lot out there. You think you don't have it because they're nocturnal or whatever, or they're very good at hiding, you know, like they are aware of their own predators, which are us, so they stay out of our eyesight as much as possible. And it's only as they become more prevalent that we start to see them on the roads as roadkill or see them like your partner did um, around the place. So there is, just because you don't see it or don't see the effects of it, doesn't mean that it's not there. It's Mustelids can be impacting the fantail populations like crazy, but just because you don't see them and you don't know any different of how productive a fantail population is supposed to be, you may not know. Once you know how to catch them, you're, you're off and away. But getting your first ferret is always the hardest, or, or stoat or weasel. One of the biggest challenges is probably the motivation, the ongoing. So people understand why you do it. They understand maybe how to get started once they speak to us but to keep going on something that never seems to end is quite difficult and that's a lot of my role is to keep that uplift that community spirit that that feeling of you're not actually doing this alone you're part of a bigger picture and the impact that you're creating on your small block is emphasized by your neighbors doing it which is emphasized across a landscape scale and that reduces the reinvasion into a beautiful forest and helps protect everything that lives in it too. The, the latest thing when I did for me was he caught a, um, a ferret, got one of my best chickens, um, and put our traps up fairly instantly, and we caught three ferrets, which was wonderful, um, and a rat, etc. We had a stoke problem, we've mainly for the last 10 years been working on our rat and rabbit mm -hmm. problem. Um, and then for the first time, probably about six or eight months ago, um, my ducks started disappearing one by one. Um, and then we realised we had a stoat. Um, we couldn't catch it, um, even though we got traps and everything. And, um, and so I um, moved my ducks into the house <laughs> to keep them safe at night. Um, and had them living in the house for probably, you know, outside during the day, but living in the house at night um, for about three months. And in that time, all of a sudden, the rabbit's population got decimated, which I can only assume was the stoat because it ran out of ducks to eat. Um, and then, yeah, and then one day, that was it. The ducks decided they weren't going to come inside anymore, so they must have sensed that it had moved on, even though we never catch a quarter. I'm, I'm on 10 acres. I've got various ducks, rescue ducks, chickens. Um, and earlier this year, there was the A team of Willow and Julia who came in to take out the stoke that took out one of my rescue ducks. So um, I, know that, I know that what you do works <laughs> um, and fully, fully support it. So.
Once you get your systems in place, yeah. and once you get those initial numbers down, it doesn't have to be time consuming. It depends on how big your piece of land is, of course, and how easy it is for you to get around your, your land. Generally speaking, it uh, probably uh, would take an hour a, a week maximum. And particularly not if you have someone that's willing to help, a neighbour who has a smaller property who's keen to help you. There are all sorts of solutions once you start thinking outside of that box. It's not just you. That's correct. Yep. There's quite a few uh, youngsters that want to do something and they could be very helpful for, for a landowner. In my capacity as contractor and volunteer organiser, and we've just got a 16-year-old uh, boy who's, um, who's very keen to help and you know he's, he's already helping in the neighbourhood in places. So, you know, that's the new generation coming on, which, you know, helps us all. So there are heaps of different things that can hold a landowner back, and there's heaps of different ways to combat that. If you are overwhelmed, um, you could start small. Just start around your house and your sheds, your veggie garden, protect what's important to you first. Um, and then you might expand out from there as you get it under control. You don't have to do everything all at once. That's not what this is about. It's about creating something that's sustainable in the long term and slowly expanding that. Um, if there's someone who's less abled, there are so many people in the community. Once you create that community, that will rally together to help you out because if they help you out, then their property is more protected too. So there's definitely capacity to work together um, in the community on that sort of stuff. For a bigger landowner too, um, contacts um, in the city, people that haven't got much mm. land and they would like to do um, something outside their um, build up area. That could be another way of doing it. Um, some of the volunteers that we have in the Huno Ranges, um, they live in the city, but they are just so glad to be out and mm. in the bush and do something um, um, that helps the bird life uh, at, at the same time. That, that, that's another option, you know, just people from the city, yeah. people that you know, come out on a Saturday, do a bit of pest control on, on, on um, pastoral land. That's, yeah. The first thing is starting to talk about your issues. And from opening that communication, the solutions might just come to you. Not putting your problem in words is a, is a, is a closed door, basically. Yeah. You can't ignore a problem and find a solution that way. So yeah, just talk about um, and, and come, come to one of the bait and trap days or um, whatever is around in, uh, at the moment already. And there are people around who can help you find that solution as well, like us. Yep. I don't have any trouble with possums, I'm not quite sure why, because it once a year they will trek through um, and I hear these thumps. Um, I have problems with rats and I, I, can't, I can't face a rat trap but I can, I can manage poison and that's probably not very good, but um, rat poison I like. So I need to know a bit more about what sort of safe rat poison is. There are multiple different ways to go. My biggest thing is Nobody judges. Some people don't like poisons. That's okay. Some people don't like to handle a dead animal and will prefer to use a poison. That's perfectly okay as well. We're gonna go through both because everyone's different. It can get overwhelming. There are so many products out there and a property can be so big. How do you know where to start? And I always say start around your house and your sheds because that contains your possessions that you're passionate about and then move into a patch of bush or a wetland that you're really passionate about because if you're passionate you're going to want to go there and then start small and expand from there as you learn because the best way to learn is not us talking at you it's doing it on the job um, but having said that everyone starts somewhere and we can give you those pointers on where to start. Rats, you have your standard rat traps, very similar to mice. Everyone knows how to use them, everyone has successes with them, yeah. Rat traps work very similarly. There's loads of different ones on the market. You can make it more attractive for a rat by thinking about where a rat moves. So a rat will move along a retaining wall, along the edge of your aviary probably. Um, they like tunnels. So they're constantly keeping an eye out on where their predators are going to come from. So if they have a wall on one side or if they have a tunnel, they only need to keep an eye out 
for what's, where they came from, what's possibly on this side and what's ahead. So they will prefer to run along a wall. Um, you can create a tunnel for your rat traps as well. Um, just out of like a real estate signage or something, just create something and staple it to a piece of wood. Um, and then you can put a little chicken mesh cover to stop your pets getting in as well if you're concerned about that, so like you, for your ducks and stuff. And then just have it along the side of the run. Baiting with peanut butter, Nutella, apparently dog treat jerky works really well. It's good to try different things, so like, like your different peanut butters, your different Nutellas, hazelnut spreads, whatever. Just because something that you think you might bait it with isn't online doesn't mean it's not going to work. So try things and feed back to your local community what's working for you because they may have rats with the same taste. So we can share information that way and better um, attack the pests. The other thing, of course, is to um, change your bait or your lure several times. Yeah. You know, done two months with peanut butter and nothing happens, just get something else, try something yeah. else. Rats are quite clean animals. They preen themselves and stuff as well, so they do like something that's clean as opposed to something that has heaps of cobwebs. Having said, and, and sometimes the scent can draw animals in because it's new and different, right? Having said that, these guys, uh, if they've got a bit of a scent of an other animal in there, that can sometimes draw them in. So we quite often suggest if you catch a ferret or something, rub the body on the trap because that scent on the trap will draw others in because they're thinking who's in my territory who's they come to investigate so these traps are the next level up if you're targeting rats or um, mustelids or dare i say hedgehogs because they will also eat baby birds and eggs and they can climb they also eat wetter and he there was one hedgehog that was found with enough legs in its stomach after a 24 hour period to account for something like 50 wetter. No. One hedgehog. So don't underestimate Miss Tiggy Winks. This is the Doc 200. It has a really strong spring mechanism, but it's very efficient and the animal will be killed very humanely, very and quickly. Quick. Was designed for mustelids, so that's your stoats, ferrets and weasels. This, this one is, is the stoats. Yeah. yeah, this one's too small to catch ferrets, so it's more weasels and stoats. But even weasels can sometimes be too light for the trigger plate. Oh, so cool. it's, it's a weight thing. It will catch rats, although it's not originally... Um, it's my best rat catching device. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, not designed for rats originally, but rats will go in because they investigate mm -hmm. and they do smell what's been in there. Yep. So there's yep. a smaller version, which is a dock. 150, 150, and a dock 250. The yeah. 250 is for the ferrets. Basically, the design is that you've got two bits of mesh with holes in, and they're at opposite sides, which means that you're less likely to get a bird wandering in or something like a cat. You want something that's really investigating what you've put in as the lure. The lure that you have will be an egg or a piece of meat, leftovers from dinner. Um, I had some mints in here once. Worked well, curried mints. Um, <laughs> so the egg is basically like a picture of an ice cream that draws you to the ice cream truck. But until you get closer and you can kind of like smell the sweetness, that's when you really get drawn in. So that's why you probably want to put something else in here that's meat or fish based alongside that egg. It's for the scent, because the egg by itself won't give off much of a scent. It's that visual lure. When they started at Piggott's, I'm sorry, oh, it might be a little bit gory. But there were so many rats there that when they went to clear the traps, there would only be the head left because the rats would be coming in. Yeah. So that shows you that that is attractive to them. We've done it at the KMA as well, where um, we caught fresh rats in the Dr. Arnold's. We put the, the rats back in as, as a lure, the dead rat, and caught the stoat uh, the week after. Predator Free New Zealand sells them. There's a few places around that sell them. Friends of Hanua Rangers has been selling them as well. When you open the lid, you want to open it this way so that it's supported because it's otherwise only supported on one male to pivot. If you yeah. open it that way, it becomes really not strong. And it also gives you an extra um, place to hold on to. 
You want to make sure that where you've got it is on stable ground and not rocking because if you are a pest and you walk into something that's not stable, you're going to back back out. Right. So to set it, you'll pull that up. Yeah. Once you've seen it a few times, it's much easier. It's just because this one's new. Yeah, so you wouldn't want to be setting it and then picking it up and moving it somewhere. Because it's no. not enough to set it up. Yeah, for sure. And then um, you definitely want to, it's very tempting to leave that unscrewed, but you probably do want to screw that down just because the force of the trap. Yeah. Moving on to baits, if you have a bush block or something, these ones are really good, they're relatively cheap. Your bait sits inside, the animal will come in, it targets both rats and possums. Most rat bait, rat baits are also possum baits and vice versa. Um, and it's a tree mountable one so you can have it out of reach of dogs and stuff, so that's quite handy. Um, the one for around the house or around the shed is, is this one. So this is just rats. They'll run through, look up, see the bait, not be able to take the bait away. They have to eat it because rats can stockpile bait. So you don't want to be refilling your stations more than, uh, say, once a week because you will be feeding a dying animal because it takes a few days for them for the poison to take effect. So these are really good, keeps kids away because of the hood, hopefully. Um, fairly secure from pets and stuff as well. And again, positioning. The thing to remember about baits is they are designed to kill mammals. If you are using baits, keep the label because if an animal or pet does unfortunately eat something, you can take that label straight to the vet and get some help as quick as possible and have the best hope of saving your animal. If you are worried about pets, just really research into your baits if that's the route you want to go down. Also on baits, there are multiple different active ingredients in different baits. It's really good to change up the brand of bait that you're using because again, they have different tastes. They might get used to something, so you want to try something else to get the extra rats in that are no longer attracted to what you have been using. But that's why you need to keep an eye on your baits. If they go off, they no longer have the potency oh. that they previously did. So you can make a rat really sick, but not kill it. And then it will no longer go for that because that didn't taste very nice and it made me feel yuck, so I'm not gonna go back and eat it. Most uh, baits are, are based on cereal oh. in a pellet form. Mm -hmm. And the poison is mixed in that. Mm -hmm. So they have to eat. They go for the cereal yeah. and ingest the, uh, the poison. If the bait is not, concealed in a plastic bag or something like that, it will pick up the moisture from outside, from the air. That's why in the, for example, this is just another tip. Um, in, the, in the KMA project, for example, we can't check the bait stations every week because there's too many of them. It takes us um, six to eight weeks to go around, which means that the, the bait, if we would have the bait pellets loose in the, in the bait stations, they would go off too easily. What we found when the numbers are low, we put the bait in a plastic bag and put that in the bait station. It will still attract the rats. Maybe not as fast, but it will attract the rats. But because there's a low number, we will still kill the rats that go for, those, um, for the bags. So if there's no rats around, the bag won't be, um, be pierced or ripped apart and the, the pellets will stay good for three months, four months, till the next rat comes along. If you wouldn't have them in a plastic bag, after three weeks you could <coughs> throw your Definitely in a wetter now, would be after two weeks, you could throw your pellets away because it's useless. This is um, Findome, which is a green pellet. Uh, it's the, what they call the first generation of uh, a blood thinner. It kills rats, but it doesn't kill the possums. And rats can actually uh, start to avoid it and um, get used to it as well. So after this one, a second generation was made, which is a blue pellet. And, um, and that's the same, it's got the same ingredient, but it's a heavier one. This is the Talon, it's a wax block, it's heavier than uh, both of them. You can put that out in the weather and it will stay okay. The poison is concealed in the wax. Then there's a newer variety. This is um, Colicalciferol, which is a, um, a calcifier of the arteries. And it's got uh, Difesanone in it as well, which is a blood thinner. 
So the combination of the two um, is what science has found out works faster and better than, for example, the Bordificum. The beauty of beauty between brackets of this product is that um, it doesn't stay in the environment as long as Bordificum on its on its own. That one was designed with your pets in mind. So if your pet gets straight into that one, it's not ideal at all. But if it eats an animal that's been killed by that, it's less likely to get poisoned. That one is double tap by Conovation. All of them should be in a enclosed bait station, whether it's a homemade one. So if you cut a hole into an ice cream container, that's now a bait station because it's contained. Yeah, you have to be aware of the fact that these things are poisons. Yeah. That's why they need to be contained to a certain, they need to be available to the targeted animal, but they have to be um, contained so that no pet animals or what, the non-targeted non species, yep, that they mm -hmm. can't get to it. So there's heaps of ways to get involved. Um, and if pest control isn't your jam, maybe you want to plant some trees instead and start that way. It's a gateway drug, I tell you. Um, <laughs> you get into pest control eventually whether you like it or not because you end up seeing the destruction that they cause. Most areas now have a group for pest control or support for revegetation projects and various other um, environmental conservation ecosystem enhancing uh, projects. There's tree plantings done by Auckland Council every winter so those sort of events are really good to pull knowledge to figure out what's out there and then to connect with your local group. And planting is native trees, planting native trees which feeds the birds. So yep. that's, that's what it boils down to, yeah. Come aboard! There's work to be done and it's good work and it's quite often fun too and enjoyable with other people, get, meeting other people in the same, doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Planting, pest control and seeing the bird life improve and the numbers of birds increase is just it's just so satisfying. Yeah. 2050 is just around the corner, really, but we have achieved uh, quite a bit in a short time that the crazy idea of uh, pest-free New Zealand 2050 came around. We've done quite well so far. Come, come aboard, join us. <laughs>